Well, welcome to another Friday night. As we continue our series in reparenting ourselves, that trauma, healing from trauma, is the process of reparenting ourselves, I want to come to part of parenting is helping your child with emotions. And we introduced that last week. And today I want to take this whole emotional quotient, your EQ or emotional intelligence, in just a little different direction. And I want to do something that uh, is a bit different. And I want to give you an actual EQ test. And this test is available online. Psychology Today offers it. Um, and, And so that's what I want to do so that you can get a sense of your emotional intelligence, your emotional quotient. So just before we get there, let me just say a few things. So we said last week that emotional intelligence is the ability to understand, use, and manage your emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. What is also important to realize is that the greater your emotional intelligence, the stronger you are in relationships, the more you succeed in school and at work and achieve your career and personal goals. It also helps you connect to your feelings, turn intention into action, and make informed decisions in your life. So... It is such an important thing. It just benefits every aspect of life. So as I give you this test today, we're not going to grade it. So that's the first thing, and some of you might be frustrated by that because you want to get an answer. But what, what, why I'm doing this is because I want you to see the questions that we'll ask, which are then going to give you insight into, oh, this area is covered in emotional talent. Oh, this area is part of emotional intelligence. And you're going to start to get a clear picture of, if I have good emotional intelligence, it affects how I act in these situations. It affects this part of my life. It affects this part of my life. So it begins to give you a clear understanding of, what emotional intelligence is, how it shows up in every different type of circumstance that you might encounter in life. So that is my goal. And from that, hopefully you'll be able to see, who I don't do very good in that area. Or, yeah, I do quite well in that area. And you'll get a feel for your emotional intelligence. You'll get a sense of the areas where you're weak and the areas where you're strong, the areas where you need to grow, And that's my goal. I I don't want this to be, oh, I need a grade at the end. I need a number. I just want you to get a feel, a picture of all of this. Now, part of what's going to happen as we do this test is that for some of you, you're going to go, well, in some circumstances, I would respond this way, but in others, I would respond this way, and you're going to see two or even three possible ways of answering the question. Don't overanalyze that, but be aware that, yes, your responses will at times depend on the situation that you're in, and just kind of log that in your mind as a, something to be aware of. So let me begin with just the 18 characteristics of emotionally intelligent people. So number one, they don't fear change. Change is something that they're able to manage well. Two, they're curious and eager to learn and grow. Three, they have a strong sense of self-awareness. Four, they show empathy toward others. Five, They pursue progress, not perfection. Six, they live balanced lives. That is so key. Seven, they are grateful for what they have. So gratitude is a key attitude in their life. Eight, they express themselves assertively in their communication. Nine, they are receptive to feedback from others. They're open to feedback. Ten, They're a good judge of character. Eleven, 
They know their own strengths and weaknesses. Twelve, they set good boundaries with others. Thirteen, when they fail, they don't beat themselves up, but are able to let go of their failures and learn from it. Fourteen, they don't hang on to grudges when others hurt them. Fifteen, they demonstrate authenticity and they're able to be vulnerable in relationships. Sixteen, they have good internal boundaries. Seventeen, they're able to regulate their intense emotions like anger. And eighteen, they are aware of underlying fear and shame, root issues in their life, and are working to grow in those areas. So eighteen characteristics of emotionally intelligent people. Now let me bring this into the world of complex trauma. The greater a person's shame issues that aren't dealt with, typically the lower their EQ. That's so important to understand. So dealing with your shame or not dealing with your shame is very, very t much tied to how emotionally intelligent you are. Direct correlation. Secondly, the more severe the child's complex trauma was, the earlier it happened, is the earlier the child had to adapt and get away from developing healthy emotional tools because they didn't work. They had to go to fight, flight, or freeze, or fawn as their main ways of coping. The earlier they had to do that, the more severely they had to do that, the lower their EQ, because they got stuck back there with a very small emotional healthy toolkit and a lot of unhealthy tools for dealing with emotions. They got stuck there at a very young age. So complex trauma, severity of it, the, how early it happened, has a great impact on your emotional quotient. And so Part of what I want you to understand is growing to become more emotional t intelligence isn't by learning just a few tricks and tools. It's by dealing with that deep stuff, the deep complex trauma stuff and all the unhealthy ways of coping that came out of that. So keep all of that in mind. Okay, so let's go into this test. I'm just going to go through it. You can... Put beside each one, if you want, um, scale of one to four. So one is never, two rarely, three sometimes, four always. And then you can kind of grade yourself as you go through it. So number one, I adjust my behavior depending on who I am interacting with. Now again, you might in your mind go, well, that depends. So... If you are a very authentic person, yes, you adjust your behavior depending on who you're with. You meet them where they're at. If it's a child, if it's an older person, you adjust a little bit, but you're still authentic. Whereas complex trauma, you become a chameleon. You go, I'm going to be what you want me to be so you'll like me. So you wear masks. You adopt roles, totally different motivation. So the one would be high emotional intelligence where you're authentic, but you adjust to meet the person where they're at. The other would be low emotional intelligence because you are adapting, adjusting in order to get people to like you. Second one, I tend to postpone or avoid discussing touchy topics. So there could be a healthy there where... I'm waiting for the right time and opportunity. I'm not going to avoid it forever, but I am picking my time carefully. Or the unhealthy, I just don't like conflict. Conflict always has been bad for me, so I avoid it at all costs. So be aware of there can be a healthy and an unhealthy in this. Three, I find myself feeling nervous about events, and I don't even know why. So deep anxiety issues. Four, if asked my three top strengths, I would have a hard time coming up with them. 
Five, I have certain compulsive habits that I can't seem to stop. Six, once a pessimistic thought pops into my head, it's like a floodgate opens, my thoughts get more and more negative. Seven, when something is bothering me, I cannot stop thinking about it. So what you're seeing is emotions can begin to change how we think, affect our thoughts. Number eight, I am stubborn. Now that can be healthy or unhealthy. Healthy, I persevere at what is healthy, even though there's lots of obstacles. Unhealthy, I'm defiant. I won't give in. I got to have it my way. I won't admit I'm wrong. Number nine, I'm not satisfied with my work unless someone else praises it. Ten, I know which situations I can handle and which ones take me out of my emotional comfort zone. So you have a self-awareness in that area. Eleven, I like learning new things. Twelve, if the situation calls for it, I can be civil to a person whom I really dislike. Thirteen, when I need to do something difficult or unpleasant, I find it hard to motivate myself to get started. So you tend to procrastinate. 14. I express my opinion even if there's a good chance other people will disagree with me. 15. I know exactly where I want to be five years from now. 16. It takes a push from others to get me going. So I'm not very self-motivated. 17. I am surprised by my emotional reactions to situations I encounter in my life. 18. I change my attitude, behavior, or appearance in order to please others. 19. I feel more comfortable when someone else makes my decisions for me. 20. I have an obsessive mind. 21. When I'm feeling down, I remind myself to focus on the good things, no matter how minor. 22. If I'm not good at something right away, I'd rather quit than waste my time. So very important, good questions into lots of subtle parts of your life that are important to look at. 23. I'm ashamed of how I look or behave. 24. I will seek out information to help me figure out how to deal with a problem I am facing. 25. If the situation calls for it, I can appear to be having a good time even if I am not enjoying myself. 26. Even when I don't want to, I consistently put others' needs ahead of my own. 27. I would not feel comfortable asking for something I want even if I really want it. 28. I spend hours wondering what people meant by their offhand remarks. 29. I consider the ethical consequences of the decisions I make. 30. If the person I'm speaking to seems ill at ease or intimidated, I will attempt to make them more comfortable. 31. I avoid fights, expressing my opinion or doing what I want for fear that I will upset others or lose their friendship. 32. When I am feeling negative emotions like anger or sadness, I try to ignore them as long as possible. 33. When I mess up, I say self-deprecating things like, I'm such a loser, stupid, can't do anything right. 34. I tend to overanalyze situations, finding problems that don't really exist. 35. I tend to assume the worst of people. 36. I keep myself up at night thinking about the problems in my life. 37. Once I get angry, there's no stopping me. I'll let everything out. 
38. I think my decisions through carefully. 39. I engage in activities that allow me to get in touch with my emotions. So I do things every day that help me be present and aware of my emotions. 40. There are so many things wrong with me that I simply cannot like myself. 41. No matter what life throws at me, I believe I can deal with it. 42. When making important decisions, logic should come into play more than emotions. 43. I feel that without my friends or family, I would be nothing. I might as well not even exist. 44. There are areas of my skill set that I would like to improve. 45. I feel that self-improvement is a lifelong process. 46. I find that it's better not to get my hopes up so that I don't end up disappointed. 47. I feel like I am just going through the motions in life, like I'm running on autopilot. 48. When applying for a job or getting involved in a team project, I know exactly how my skills can benefit the organization. 49. I am impatient. 50. When I feel negative emotions starting to crop up, I stop and take a moment to ask myself what I am feeling and why. 51. I make comments I wish I could take back. 52. When I am feeling anxious, I can think of ways to calm myself down. 53. I have difficulty snapping myself out of a grumpy mood. 54. I feel discouraged. 55. When I am upset with someone, I let them know. 56. I feel that people take advantage of me. And part of that is I sense I let them take advantage of me. 57. When something bad happens to me, I manage to find a silver lining. 58. Before making a decision, I consult others to help me make the right choice. 59. I look for ways to improve my performance in my work. 60. I make impulse purchases. 61. I am completely at ease when a conversation shifts to the topic of feeling. 62. I do whatever I can to keep myself from crying. 63. I feel helpless. 64. If I have an uneasy feeling about a situation or a person but cannot put my finger on what it is that bugs me, I just dismiss it, ignore it, move on. 65. I have the urge to flee when someone gets emotional around me. I can't wait to get out of there. 66. I find it hard to express my feelings to others. 67. I get upset without really knowing who or what exactly is bothering me. 68. I think about ending my life. 69. I manage to find an outlet to express my emotions like writing, playing, drawing, etc., 70. I refuse to give up. 71. I try to keep the situation in perspective. 72. I have confidence in my abilities. 73. When there's something I don't like about myself, my work, or my relationship, I take steps to change things. 74. Off the top of my head, I can name three things that motivate me to work hard. 75, I am happy with my life. So that's the first part. Now, the second part is going to give eight situations, rank them as to whether they're a minor stressor, would be a minor stressor in your life, a major stressor, or a disaster. So number one, how much would it get you stressed out to have to interact with people you don't get along with. Two, 
Is it minor, major, or disaster? The fact that you're getting older. Three, having to deal with bad weather. Four, when you misplace or lose something. What reaction happens inside of you? Number five, being stuck in traffic. Six, having to plan a vacation, get everything organized and ready. Seven, planning and going through a move. Eight, realizing that you're too busy and you don't have enough leisure time. So that one's very interesting to think about is how it would affect you. Now, the third part is I'm going to start to get into how you would approach situations. So, the statement, I face problems head on. So, three options. Number one, I analyze the problem, look for solutions, choose the best one. If that's the way you are, okay, that's it. Or B, sometimes I face problems head on, but often I try to avoid the situation for a while, hoping that it will go away. But if it doesn't, then I face it. Or C, no, not me at all. I don't face problems head on. I stick my head in the sand, deny that the problem exists, or avoid it repeatedly. Number two, when something is bothering me, so five different options. I give in to the negative emotions until they are all I can think about so I just get more and more negative. B, something's bothering me. I just get distract, distract myself as much as possible so I don't have to think about it. C, I go and seek out help from others, even if it's just to have someone to talk to. D, I get to the root of the issue and find a way to solve the problem. E, I allow myself to wallow in pain and self-pity for a bit, then pick myself up and find a solution. Now, you might have more than one of those. That would be true of you, and that's okay. Number three, when a plan I have put into place falls through, three options. I view it as an opportunity to make a new and a better plan, or I get discouraged and just drop the whole idea, or I contemplate whether or not it's worth trying again. Four, when something gets tough at work or school, three options. Stop trying. It's not going to make a difference anyways. Give up. Or don't try much harder, but I'm not going to give up either. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Or work harder. I know I can succeed if I work harder. Number five. In most disagreements, four options. I am willing to compromise and meet the person halfway. B, I strive to win, but compromise if I can't win. C, refuse to give in until the other person does or sees things my way, so I win at any cost. Or D, just give in and let the other person do what they want. In general, number six, my performance evaluations, A, go as I expected they will. So I'm not usually surprised when I go into a performance evaluation. I'm pretty self-aware of my strengths and weaknesses and what I bring to the company. Or they go pretty much as expected, but sometimes I'm surprised by a few unexpected comments that are either positive or negative. Or they leave me very surprised. I ended up receiving a, a way better review than I thought I would. So I was going in thinking I was going to get a terrible review, and I'm surprised because it's way better. Or they leave me be surprised because I went in thinking I was doing a way lot better than I am, and I'm getting a terrible review. Seven. When I assess how I feel emotionally about a situation or a person, five things. Number one, I focus on what feels wrong, and then I just ignore any positive emotions that I might have. So I just focus totally on the negative emotions. B, I focus on the positive, 
but try and try to ignore the negatives, so the flip. C, I allow myself to feel both the positive and the negative emotions. D, I suppress my emotions and try to look at it rationally. E, I listen to my emotions and I look at it rationally. Number eight, adjusting to change. In general, three options. Is not the least bit appealing to me. I tend to avoid change as much as possible. B, takes me some time to adjust to change. I don't avoid it when it's necessary, but I certainly don't always like it. C, it's easy for me to adjust to change. I'm probably the one who instituted, instituted the change in the first place. Number nine, when a person's opinion is very different from mine and I have doubts about the validity of their argument, responses, possible responses. One, I hear them out, I listen to the whole argument before making a judgment. B, I listen to them but occasionally interrupt to question the argument. C, I listen but let them know immediately that I think their opinion is questionable. D, I brush them off, I have no patience who can't, with people who can't see the truth. Ten, the more difficult the challenge for possible responses, the more determined I am to succeed, the more I question my ability to exceed, the more discouraged the get, I get, and D, the more I feel like giving up. When I'm talking to someone who has a limited, limited vocabulary or an understanding of words, so they don't have the education you do, maybe they don't, don't have the IQ that you do, so four possible responses when you're interacting with someone like that. I become very impatient, and that would start to become obvious. B, I correct them regularly. They're serious grammatical errors. C, I just end the conversation. I just don't have patience to listen for long in these situations. Or D, I let them speak without interruption. I adjust my vocabulary so that they can understand what I'm saying. Number 12. If I found out that the company I work for was engaged in unethical practices, quit immediately. B, gather evidence and report the company to the proper authorities. C, complain to family and friends but not do anything about it. D, won't do anything differently. I just keep do doing my job. E, write a scathing letter to the president of the company and insist they change their practices. F, I'd be upset and want to quit, but would be afraid to. I wouldn't be able to find another job, so I'd just put up with it. Thirteen, your company raises money for a charity. You and your boss are counting the donations, and the total is $10,200. The boss decides to even things out to $10,000, and he pockets two hundred. dollars You're the only witness. So your boss could easily get away with it. How would you respond? So, A, you tell him it was wrong and insist that he put it back and hope that he would change his mind. B, you'd insist that he put it back and then tell other management about what he had done. C, you'd threaten to tell if he didn't put it back, but you wouldn't actually follow through on the threat. D, you'd make a disapproving face, but wouldn't do anything else. E, wouldn't do anything at all, and you'd even rationalize that $200 wasn't that big a deal. Or F, you'd threaten to tell unless he gave you half. 14, how often do you find yourself going against your morals or principles despite your better judgment? And 15, you're working as a salesperson for a company. Would you advocate a product or service to a client knowing that it wouldn't fit their needs? 16. You're working on a long-term project and there's a major payoff coming in the future. You've been working on it for six months without much observable progress. 
So it's been a lot of hard work, but not a lot of evidence that you're making progress. How would you most likely be feeling at this moment? A, fed up, ready to give up. B, frustrated, but try to remind yourself that it'll be worth it in the end. C, feel just fine because I know I'm working towards an amazing goal. Or D, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have lasted the six months I'd already have quit. 17. Your friend is angry, and you're not sure why. How would you handle that? A, ignore them until they get over it. B, angrily demand an explanation. C, calmly ask them what's bothering them. D, behave normally around them, like act like nothing's wrong until hopefully it blows over. E, apologize for whatever it is you might have done to upset them and hope that it makes it better. 18, you're struggling with your job and you have been unhappy for quite a while. You would quit, but your salary is great in comparison to most jobs you've had, and you're worried about finding work in an uncertain economy. You're feeling extremely depressed about your situation. What would you do? So A, talk to your boss to try to find a way to make your job more tolerable. B, quit immediately before things get worse. C, look for another job. D, do nothing and hope things get better. E, deliberately sabotage things at work. 19, you're incredibly nervous about a job interview scheduled for tomorrow. You believe you don't measure up to the potential employer standards and you worry that you will be humili humiliated. What would you do? A, remind yourself of the successes you've had in the past to build up your confidence. B, scoff at your concerns and tell yourself that you are silly to be worried about it. C, tell yourself that your concerns are understandable. D, go over some possible strategies for how to handle things that might come up in the interview. Number 20, you have just broken up after years of a codependent relationship and you're devastated. How would you respond? A, isolate. Keep yourself away from everybody till you recover. B, stay busy and distract so you don't have to feel the feelings. C, talk to a therapist. D, go on a dating website, start looking for another potential partner. E, think of ways to try to hook your ex back into the relationship. Your goal is to get your ex back at any cost. F, obsessively go over the events of the breakup over and over, looking for what went wrong. G, become increasingly angry at your ex and blame them. H, look to the future and try to learn every possible lesson you can from this relationship. I, enjoy the time of being single for a while. 21. You're meeting your partner at a restaurant after work. They're 45 minutes late. And when they finally arrive, they bring a friend with them. The only reason they are late is because they were having so much fun with this friend that they lost track of time. You are furious. What, how would you handle the situation? A, vent your anger on your partner in front of your friend explode. B, take your partner's side right away and vent your anger on them. C, don't say anything, but bring it up the next time you're mad at them. D, take subtle shots or remarks at your partner throughout the meal, so passive-aggressive stuff. E, give your partner the cold shoulder throughout the meal. Give them one word, cold answers, because you're going to teach them a lesson. Or F, withdraw from the conversation and spend the meal silently pouting. G, get up and leave the restaurant. You don't need this kind of treatment. H, try to forget about it and just have a good time. I, bring it up when you get home and tell them that you would appreciate an apology and ask them to text or call if this ever happens again.
Number 22, you're at the dentist's office, you've taken the morning off work for the appointment, even though you've got a fast approaching deadline for a huge project, you assume that you would be in and out within an hour, which wouldn't be a, a big deal. You could manage that. Unfortunately, your appointment was for 9.30, and you're still sitting there at 10.15, and you haven't been called yet. You approach the receptionist to resolve the situation. She tells you once again that the dentist will see you shortly, but experience has proven that this just isn't the case. How would you respond? A, get angry at the receptionist and let them know how completely unacceptable this is. B, tell the receptionist how busy your schedule is and ask if there's anything they can do to get you in sooner. See to the receptionist that you need to reschedule because you've got to get back to work. D, leave and decide to never go back to that dentist again. E, do nothing. But feel your stress level and anger build by the minute. F, continue to wait, but use the time to do some work on the project. 23, your manager is continually dumping tasks on your desk. They are tasks that have to be completed before morning, and he always plops them down near the end of the day. The tasks are not your responsibility, but you have been helping him out without complaint for several weeks. You have been patient with your manager when he explains why he can't take care of it himself, but this has become a regular occurrence, and it's starting to bother you. What would you do? I'm not going to give you options for that. It's just an area now that you can start to think about and see, oh yeah, different possible options from healthy to unhealthy. 24, at a meeting, one of your colleagues makes a proposal and you can't believe your ears because the idea that your colleague is proposing is your own idea. You had discussed it with her just last week. You had wanted her feedback so that you could finalize the whole concept before taking it to your boss. So you're in this meeting and all of a sudden they're presenting it as if it's their idea. So you wait patiently until the end of the presentation, hoping that this colleague will at least give you credit for the idea, but it doesn't happen. They claim all the credit for themselves. What would you do? 25. The president of the company has just hired his son for a summer position in the department that you manage. His son is intelligent and will be able to do the job quite well. In his father's eyes, his son can do no wrong. As the weeks go by, you notice that the son is doing less and less work and leaving earlier and earlier in the afternoon. His behavior is unfair to the other employees who work long hours and abide by stressful deadlines. How should you handle that situation? 26. You're over at your parents' house for a dinner party. There are several other guests, some you know and others whom you've just met for the first time. During the meal, your mother says something about your table manners that you interpret as a put down. So she's shaming you, putting, taking a shot at you. You feel really embarrassed since everybody heard her comment. How should you respond? Last one. One of your close friends is going through a very trying time. He's just had major surgery, needs a lot of help around the home for the next several months during his recovery. You have been gladly pitching in several times a week with house cleaning, grocery shopping, laundry duties. But lately, the demands have been getting to be a bit more than you can bear. You're feeling overworked and underappreciated. As time, go by, time goes by, your friend seems to be coming more demanding. How should you address this issue? So, that is an EQ test. Hopefully, as you've gone through that, you've gained a sense of areas where you probably would handle quite maturely, 
areas that you wouldn't handle quite maturely. And I hope it just kind of broadens your understanding, broadens your thinking, helps you grow in self-awareness. Next week, we're going to begin to look at how to begin to become more aware of our emotions as the first step of growing in emotional intelligence. That's the end of part one. Going to take a short break, come back for part two, which is the spiritual component. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. You're free to go. We'll see you next time. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. I thought since we're talking about emotions, I would talk about the spiritual practice of meditation because many people find that meditation is a key part of their growth in dealing with their emotions well. What is important for me to explain is that when we use the term meditation, it really has developed two meanings, and that's what I want to explain to you. Both are within spiritual practices, and what is interesting to me is that some religious traditions really only favor one form of meditation and kind of are negative about the other form of meditation, which I think is sad because I think both are very important, and I'll see seek to explain why. So the first way that meditation is used, and it's probably the least common way, except in certain traditions, but it comes from the Greek word for a cow chewing the cud. It is used in the, book, the Bible in Joshua 1.8, where it says, God says to Joshua, study this book of instruction continually. So master it. But then he says, meditate on it day and night. So don't just read it, chew the cud. Go over and over in your mind day and night so that you really master it, so that you might be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. So what it's saying is, like a cow, you take in a topic, you read it, or a cow eats the food. Then the cow brings it up and chews on it, and chews on it. Then he swallows it again. Then brings it back up and chews on it some more. Swallows it again. That's what chewing the cud is. And so what it is saying is, you take in a whole bunch of information, but you just don't leave it there. Now you bring it up to your mind and you meditate on it. You go over it. You look at it from different angles. You're looking to get more nutrition from it, more truth from it. Just like that's the purpose of the cow chewing the cud, is to get every last morsel of nutrition and value from that food. And so it's focusing the mind to explore. It is using curiosity to begin to explore and get deeper understanding every possible morsel of nutrition from that truth. So for example, some people might take the Bible story of the prodigal son, and then they just want to meditate on it. They want to imagine what it was like for the young man. Then they want to imagine what it was like for the father. Then they want to imagine what it was like for the brother. Then they want to think about what it was like for the community. All kinds of ways of looking at it. Each one just adds nuances of meaning that make the story fuller and more meaningful. Some might take the feeding of the 5,000. What was it like for the little boy? What was it like for the people who came? and realized there was no food. What was it like for the disciples? What was it like for Jesus? All that was part of meditating. Some might take the verse in Hebrews where God promises, I will never leave you or 
forsake you. I will never abandon you. Such a key verse for people coming out of complex trauma. And they just want to meditate on what does that mean? In what circumstances could I apply that? Others want to take like the Christmas story and they want to look at it through the eyes of the shepherd, through the eyes of Mary, through the eyes of Joseph, through the eyes of the angels, through the eyes of Jesus, through the eyes of the magi or the wise men, all different, just chewing the cut, chewing the cut. That's the first use of meditation. The second, which is what most are common or familiar with in our culture, is it's a way of slowing the brain down. It's a way of centering a busy brain and grounding it so that you can be present to yourself. So the whole issue that it's dealing with is that most of us live busy lives where we get up in the morning, our internal RPMs go up because we've got all kinds of tasks to accomplish, people to see, and our brains are just busy, busy. There's tons of distraction. We're not very present to ourselves because we are performing, but we can't sustain that. If we're going to be healthy, we got to get back to our parasympathetic nervous system. We got to slow the internal RPMs down. We got to slow our brains down. And so meditation becomes a way of emptying the brain of all the clutter of the day, stopping the brain from obsessive thinking and worrying, helping this agitated brain to calm down and find a place of peace. And so people can use a word, a, a mantra, an um that helps them do that. Some can use breathing. Some use visualization that just helps them get to that quiet internal place. So that's also defined as meditation. I think both are very important mental disciplines. Both are involved, if you think about it, in managing the limbic brain and in making the cortex healthier. So both serve purposes in accomplishing that, which is what we want. So the first one, chewing the cud, <clears throat> it is intentionally getting me to use my cortex to think about things to identify lies, to see truth, to use my imagination and curiosity to explore, to think. That is such an important thing. It, it really fights against the cultural, subtle cultural pressure. We have to just be passive in our cortex, to be entertained, to not think. So the first type of meditation says... No, I'm going to keep pushing myself to think, to grow and to think well. The second type of meditation, it helps my limbic brain when it's triggered to settle down. It helps my nervous system to get out of the sympathetic into the parasympathetic so that I can be present to myself, present to others so that I can truly rest and relax and be rejuvenated. So both types of meditation are necessary for a healthy brain. They're necessary for a healthy life. They're important tools for healing complex trauma. And so I hope that you'll understand that a little more clearly and be able to explore it more and develop those two forms of meditation in your own life. Let's pray. God, thank you for, again, the opportunity to think about topics that are important for help, helping us grow, helping us develop tools to get healthier. And there's been so much controversy, sadly, around this meditation topic. And I just pray this will help some people get clarity, but also realize that it's not 
making one thing an evil thing, that they're both such helpful tools. Amen. That's the end of another Friday night. Thanks for being with us. Hopefully you'll have